Local programming on KRWG made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Fronteras, a Changing America. I'm Monica Ortiz Uribe. Today we're talking business and focusing specifically on the border. Maybe under the current economic situation, you haven't noticed, but trade between the United States and Mexico is booming. In the last 20 years since the North American Free Trade Agreement was signed, that trade has grown by a factor of five. That amounts to about a billion dollars crossing our border every day. One of the cities that's taken advantage of that booming trade is just across the state line in El Paso. Here's my report. This old warehouse district in downtown El Paso is buzzing with new life. Most of the businesses here are owned by young, ambitious locals like Norbert Portillo. He owns a Spanish-style tapas restaurant called Tabla. It's exciting. I mean, a lot of my chef friends are opening up places left and right, and it's good because they're all, they're all doing really well. Together with its Mexican sister city, El Paso Juarez make up the largest border metropolis in the Southwest. In the last 10 years, El Paso's economy has been growing at a faster pace than the national economy. That's true for other Texas border cities like McAllen, Laredo, and Brownsville. A study by the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas attributes two-thirds of that growth to cross-border trade. Behind me is the Bridge of the Americas. It's the commercial gateway that connects the United States to Mexico. Every week, thousands of trucks cross here, carrying the merchandise that feeds the booming trade industry on both sides of the border. In the last 10 years, that trade has brought more and more well-paying jobs to border cities like El Paso. Roberto Coronado works at the El Paso branch of the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. One in every four new jobs created in El Paso over the last 20 years could be attributed to the maquila business across the border. In the last 20 years since NAFTA was signed, trade between the United States and Mexico has quintupled to about $450 billion per year. In those two decades, the U.S. also lost thousands of manufacturing jobs. Texas border cities like El Paso were hit particularly hard. After NAFTA passed, El Paso really suffered. The city relied heavily on manufacturing jobs. This building used to be a factory where Wrangler jeans were made. After NAFTA, it closed, and those jobs went south to Mexico. But now, this building has been revived by new companies that are hiring mostly young people. They go out to eat, buy new homes, and shop at local businesses. Let's go check it out. One of these companies is Secure Origins. Its business is to monitor the transportation of goods across the U.S.-Mexico border using GPS and computer technology. Their goal is to prevent contraband from mixing with the cargo. The company is currently expanding to move more trucks faster. John Rippey is the chief of operations. We have $80 billion in land trade every single year coming through in this particular region. If we could increase that 10%, that is billions of dollars that are coming back across our border. Those are more jobs. That's the increased quality of life. But border cities like El Paso still have a ways to go. Pockets of poverty still exist across the region. And El Paso's per capita income is still 30 percent below the national average. But the signs of new prosperity are undeniable. There's the ongoing revival downtown, a new medical school, and an upcoming AAA baseball team. All good news after a long struggle. Monica Ortiz Uribe, KRWG TV. So Texas and California have always been the biggest trading partners with Mexico, but uh, what about New Mexico? To answer that question, we have two guests with us today. Uh, first, we have uh, Jerry Pacheco. He's uh, vice president of the Border Industrial Association, and Ed Camden. He's president of uh, Southwest Steel Coil. Um, and so uh, thank you, gentlemen, for, for coming in today. And uh, let's start with you, Jerry. Um, tell us uh, 
What is New Mexico doing in terms of uh, cross-border trade? Well, um, uh, to use uh, your analogy about the billion dollars a, uh, a day between the United States and Mexico, we have a, a small little sliver of that. But New Mexico's trade is approaching about 500 million a year with Mexico. Uh, when I got started out of college, we were doing 16 million total annual sales to Mexico as a state. So it's just skyrocketed. Um, what's going on at the border right now in the Santa Teresa Sunland Park region is incredible. Uh, you've got uh, companies locating as close as they can to the border to sell to their Mexican buyers on the other side of the border. And you've got the biggest project on the entire U.S.-Mexico border, which is Union Pacific's uh, $418 million uh, intermodal park, diesel refueling station, and crew changing station going on. If you ever go down there, it looks like the face of the moon. It's just incredible what's happening at the border. So I understand New Mexico is kind of late in the game in terms of uh, getting on board with uh, cross-border trade. Uh, why is that? Oh my goodness. I sat down one day about 20 years ago and I, I, I thought, well, that's the most, that's a $64,000 question. Um, when you look at New Mexico, um, the, the state's traditional economic political base is centered between Santa Fe and Albuquerque. The border has been kind of um, uh, not paid attention to. It hasn't been very populated. Um, and then New Mexico is um, a big state, but we have a small population. We don't make a lot of things in New Mexico. A typical U.S. state has 12-15% uh, of its economy based in value-added industry. In New Mexico, we have about 5%, so we don't make a lot of stuff. But that's changing quite a bit as out-of-state companies discover that New Mexico's biggest advantage in terms of Mexico is that we're right there, we're, uh, our geographic location with Mexico. And that's really uh, gained momentum in the last 10 years. And so what, what is that change due to? Why all of a sudden is now New Mexico paying attention uh, to the south side of the border? Well, because the state finally um, uh, decided to want to stake and trade with Mexico. So in 1993, the state built the Santa Teresa Port of Entry, which is the state's commercial port of entry with Mexico. It's true that Columbus is a, a, um, a commercial port of entry, but it's mostly agricultural based. Santa Teresa, as the crow flies, is about 10 miles west of downtown El Paso. And it's, it's a reliever port for the traffic going back and forth. And around that port of entry is where the industrial base has been formed. Well, well, take us there. What What is it like? What is there? I mean, for someone who's never been to the industrial Well, and, you know, people who've never been down there, they always ask what Santa Teresa is. It's a big city. We're, we're not a city. We're just a, a general part of the county. And it's only got about 3,500 residents in, in the Santa Teresa Country Club area. But uh, just west of the Country Club, you have three industrial parks that are geared towards attracting what are called maquiladora suppliers. Maquiladoras being twin plants, uh, you know, you have one in the United States, one in Mexico. Uh, people like Ed uh, get up every day, they go to their plants, they, they sell components, they sell raw materials to buyers across that border or to other suppliers supplying the maquilas. And that has created for us an economic development opportunity that, that I always say is bigger than tourism. It's going to be bigger than, than call centers in Rio Rancho. It's bigger than all of that. We need to get a, in front of these maquila suppliers and convince them that New Mexico is a good place to land instead of going automatically to other places on the border. Yeah, so, so Ed, you said your, your business is based in the Santa Teresa Industrial Park. Um, tell, us about, uh, tell us about Southwest Steel Coil. What do you, sure. what do you all do? Sure, absolutely. We, uh, Southwest Steel Coil is a uh, processor and distributor of uh, raw materials like steel, uh, carbon steel, stainless steel, and aluminum. Uh, we uh, we uh, buy big coils from steel mills and uh, aluminum mills across the country and across the world. Uh, we rail them uh, via rail freight, via Union Pacific and BNSF uh, into our building. Uh, we unload them with overhead cranes. These coils will be uh, uh, 40 to 50,000 pounds a piece. So if you see one going down the road on a truck, uh, uh, it's, it's one what of those. What does it look like? Uh, they're, they're, uh, they're very small for as much as they weigh, uh, but uh, you know, the, the coil weighs more than the truck that it's on, let's put it that way. But uh, uh, we rail those in, we then uh, process uh, into forms that manufacturing companies can use. A manufacturer, a typical manufacturer, uh, cannot use a 45,000 pound, five foot wide coil of steel. Uh, so we'll process it into narrower slit coil, into sheet products, blank products uh, that are still raw material, but they're semi-finished and ready for manufacture. Uh, our customers will make things like uh, 
uh, sealing diffusers, grills and registers for HVAC applications. Uh, they'll like make, the ones uh, you have at home? Exactly, like your, grill, your, uh, your air conditioning unit outside your house, the propeller uh, has probably got our metal uh, processed in our building uh, in it. Um, the, uh, your, your white light, uh, fluorescent light fixture in your kitchen is probably our metal in it. Um, and also electrical, electronics, your cable converter box may have our metal in it. Uh, your, your washer or dryer uh, that you purchase it's, uh, uh, that's made in Juarez may very well have uh, our metal in it. So uh, it's the raw material that goes into the, the, the manufactured products that you go buy that are made out of steel and aluminum. So what's the what's the uh, what's the trade portion of your of your business, or what's the cross border interaction of uh, what you do? About ninety uh, plus ninety plus percent goes into Mexico. Uh, a very small percentage uh, goes to customers in the United States. Those customers are typically uh, stampers or fabricators that are making uh, semi finished parts for companies in Mexico. So, uh, and then that that product goes over, gets assembled, and comes back in a uh, in the form of a washer or dryer or a light fixture or a refrigerator or what have you. Um, and uh, most, of our, most of our trade is with customers in Juarez, uh, but we do ship to Chihuahua, we ship to Reynosa, we ship to Ojinaga, uh, other cities that are uh, either on the border or a little further into Mexico. So what's the advantage of being in, in Santa Teresa and in, in New Mexico versus uh, just across state line in, in Texas? Our, our location has actually been, uh, been our success. One. Uh, uh, we are competing uh, in large part with, with companies who are not next to the border. Uh, so we have a tremendous freight advantage. Uh, we also have a convenience advantage. We have a cost advantage because we're close and we have a convenience advantage. Our customers are uh, bringing those finished products across the border typically to a distribution center uh, and then that truck is going back empty. So they swing by our facility, uh, pick up their raw materials and it's essentially free freight back to their plant in Juarez. Um, so we're, if we're close to the border, the closer we are, the more convenient we are, uh, the more attractive we are to do business with. Um, as far as New Mexico versus Texas, uh, certainly there, you know, Texas uh, provides some good opportunities. Uh, I think New Mexico, and Jerry can speak better to him, probably has some, uh, some incentives uh, that are in place that, that uh, are pretty attractive. Uh, our company is uh, actually based out of California, out of Los Angeles, uh, and this was a greenfield facility we built uh, and chose to go to New Mexico rather than Texas at the time we built the facility. So. Yeah, so Jerry, why don't you tell us about some of those, uh, some of those advantages um, and incentives that New Mexico offers? Sure, um, you know, uh, geographic location is number one, obviously, because we're right next to Juarez, which is the maquiladora capital of Mexico. But over the years, um, uh, through different um, uh, gubernatorial administrations and, and with the support of the legislature, we've actually created some neat things that are unique to the border. Uh, the latest one being we have an overweight zone that's six, that sits six miles north of the port of entry. In Mexico, you have trucks that can be loaded up to 96,000 pounds. In the United States, 80,000 is generally the limit. Um, mm -hmm. And you, you, if you bring your Mexican trucks to the border going north, uh, you have to unpack them to get to the 80,000 pounds. Well, we, we got an idea through the Border uh, Industrial Association, through our membership, you know, if we change that and we, we created a limited zone whereby those Mexican trucks wouldn't have to offload. Because in logistics, pennies are, are king. I mean, you know, pennies on a dollar is what a lot of these companies are making. And it's if a we, time, right? Oh yeah, There's and it's a time, time factor of time. So we went to the legislature, got the support of the governor. We, we founded and established a six mile overweight zone. It also applies to Columbus because that's a commercial port of entry. But that alone has brought in five new companies in the last year because they want to be there with the distribution center. They want to come directly from Mexico into the United States. We've done other things like incentives um, that are specific to the border. If you're a trade support company, what, what's called a trade support company like a customs brokerage firm or even a logistics firm, you are abated from having to collect gross receipts tax for a period of time as an incentive to go into that border zone. We also have a, a 20 mile zone north of the US uh, Mexican border in which let's say if Ed comes in here and he hires some people from El Paso because they have some certain skills in Texas that don't readily exist here, um, provided that he meets certain conditions in his company, that El Pasoan is abated from paying New Mexico personal income taxes, which a lot of companies have complained about because uh, we're, we're a contiguous area separated by an invisible line between uh, Texas and New Mexico. 
And a company can relocate anywhere, but the business environment can be very, very different. So we've worked on, on some of these programmatic things to attract more businesses to that area. Okay, well, can you give us an idea of what, what, other, um, what other businesses are, are, are at this industrial park? Oh, sure, I mean, we, it's a hodgepodge. We've got um, uh, packaging companies, we've got uh, cable companies, we've got uh, copper extrusion companies, we've got sterilization companies that sterilize medical equipment coming from Mexico. We've got a bunch of logistics companies that, that move freight back and forth. We've got uh, TI, uh, TE Connectivity, which does telecommunication systems. Um, right across the border, we've got the big, big Foxconn plant making 55,000 Dell computers a day that are crossing northbound into the United States. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a frame company. It's, it's, it's an interesting mix, and not a single company that is in those parks was from New Mexico. And mm -hmm. I say that because that's a testament to outside companies coming to New Mexico, investing here, creating jobs because of New Mexico's advantages. And Ed, can you tell us a little bit about how, um, has your company grown at all since you first came to New Mexico and is there any future growth uh, in, in, the, in the plants? Absolutely, we, uh, we've been here for uh, 12 years, um, uh -huh. constructed the plant in 2000, and we've had, uh, we've had good growth um, uh, all along. Uh, two years ago I, I moved to the area um, and we started a, an effort to kind of uh, uh, retool our business plan. Uh, and we've actually, we've doubled our, our sales twice in the last two years. Uh, we've gone from 14 employees to 35. Uh, and those are all, um, um, you know, good wage earning positions with, with excellent benefits. Um, and uh, it, we're, we're continuing to grow. We're going to be breaking ground on another building addition uh, in January that will add an additional 35,000 square feet to the plant. Uh, more investment for the state of New Mexico and uh, more jobs associated with that as well. And that's so. two in a year, isn't it? I yeah, mean, we, fin we finished our last one in March, so <laughs> we're uh, uh, the the paint's dry, but that's about uh, about all we can say. So. And so your your employees, uh, where do mm -hmm. they live? Uh, many of them live in El Paso, uh, but increasingly uh, we are recruiting and hiring uh, people that live in New Mexico. There is a little bit more housing now down in Santa Teresa, so there are some new uh, housing developments. Um, and we actually have some, uh, I, I live here in Las Cruces and I travel every day. Uh, our two newest employees actually live here in Las Cruces as well and drive over every day. So we're uh, uh, increasingly uh, recruiting and, and hiring uh, folks from New Mexico. Yeah, so then I wonder, um, so if, if this is a growing sector down here in southern New Mexico, uh, how does that, uh, does that economically benefit the rest of the state or, oh, or the does. nearby area? This, this is the mantra we've been using. Um, because sometimes when we go up to Santa Fe, and again, the power base economically and politically is up there. Mm -hmm. Sometimes if you're down on the border, you feel a little unloved, okay? So we have to go up there and we have to convince the legislature. And, you know, we certainly have had the year of the governor. She's been great with her, you know, support and through Secretary John Barella's support of the Economic Development Department. And the legislature, too, has been very, very good to us. But, um, you know, the mantra we're using is that we've always been a taker in southern New Mexico. We've taken more from the state coffers than we've contributed from a tax base. We finally have an opportunity to become a giver, a net giver to the state's coffers. And what I mean by that is that we're going to contribute to the economic base of the entire state. And it's not just isolated in the southern part of the state. The taxes that we pay and that companies such as Ed's pay, uh, both uh, you know, as an investment and their employees, go to our general fund and the, it rises all boats, or it raises all boats, if you want to use that analogy about the sea, you know, the tide. The tide. Um, and we're, we're trying to convince our, our friends around the state that it's a good thing that's happening on the border. Even if they're not directly connected to it, it's a good thing for the state. Do they come down and visit? Yes, they do. <laughs> we get a lot of friends, especially now that the Union Pacific project, I mean, that's, you're, you're talking about the biggest project that Union Pacific has anywhere in the nation in New Mexico, so we get a lot of uh, uh, curiosity, you know, uh, seekers and people that want to see it themselves. And I was driving the site actually yesterday with a guy that was thinking of uh, um, coming down to Santa Teresa. So yes, it's it's a good thing for the state. Well, tell us what's the latest with uh, the Union Pacific construction? Oh my goodness, uh, they finished the first phase, which was the dirt work. They're essentially taking a 12 and a half mile strip along the the main line and putting about 75 new miles worth of track along that. They're going to build their inner mold yards, which they're going to bring in freight on containers, and the containers can be offloaded, transported, 
what have you. And that's attracted this new wave of interest in southern New Mexico, and we've been recruiting businesses related to that. Um, an interesting statistic, just to give you a, an idea of how big the project is, is that one of the superintendents told me that they're spending about $45,000 on diesel per day. And the other thing that sticks in my mind is he said, for the amount of dirt we're moving, if you put it in railroad cars, that car would stretch about 230 miles long. That's the enormity of the project. And how many, uh, how many people are expected to be employed once it's 600 up and permanent on site. And that's just for Union Pacific. That doesn't include all the ancillary businesses that are going to be right there. Okay. So it's, it's, I always say it's the biggest thing in southern New Mexico since the port of entry, the Santa Teresa port, was opened. Yeah, yeah. And so how, how, is, um, how is infrastructure at the, at the industrial site? Um, is, how is it uh, in terms of traffic, in terms of uh, businesses for your, uh, to go out to lunch or um, give, give us a it's sense? A, of it's certainly improving. Okay. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, if, if you want to head out to lunch, you've got a three or four mile drive to, uh, to get a hamburger somewhere. But, uh, uh, you know, traffic is not uh, particularly heavy for the amount of activity that's there. Um, what about know, at the border itself? Uh, at the border, our border crossing is, uh, in my opinion, is the easiest to go back and forth. Uh, I use it when I, when I travel uh, into Juarez. Uh, it's typically no wait going in and no more than a five or ten minute wait coming out. Um, unless you've just got a particular event that's that's occurred that uh, mm -hmm. I think on holidays it's a uh, a lot of Mexican citizens use that port to leave and go north so right. it's a All little busy. All ports of entry yeah. exactly. right yeah. now are, are very exactly. busy. Exactly. And is there any kind of collaboration um, or associations between um, all the companies that are based there or does everyone pretty much... Uh, oh, no, absolutely, in fact the, the Border Industrial Association is our uh, is our mechanism for getting getting together and tackling problems together uh, and Jerry can speak to that. Uh, you founded that how many years ago? It's been about four years ago. Okay. That we, we, we finally got smart and realized we're not an incorporated municipality. We don't have a chamber of commerce. And a lot of the issues uh, that we face are very unique to the industrial base at the border. So mm -hmm. we, uh, we formed that and um, we've done everything from uh, craft our own legislation to create incentives to working on issues such as uh, workforce development, which is a big issue for us. But uh, the magnitude of what's going on there is just incredible. As Ed said, um, the trade at the port of Santa Teresa that used to be counted uh, two and a half years ago was about a billion dollars a year. That is now about 1.3 billion a month, the value of trade. It's, it's ranked now in, uh, I, saw, I saw a statistic, it was either ranked in the top five or top seven in terms of commercial ports on the entire US-Mexico border, to give you an idea. Wow. Well, well. Why don't you give us then a sense of uh, what's what's up and coming? What can we look forward to? What are you working on now? Oh, I mean, uh, our days down there are <laughs> working on a multitude of issues. But the Union Pacific project, not to beat a dead horse, that's going to be the main catalyst for development in the area. Um, just the enormity of that project. Second thing that's happening, it's a good thing, is the Port of Santa Teresa is being expanded. We're getting more lanes, more modern equipment, and what have you. And then we can't forget the Mexican side of the border. Right on the other side of the, of the port of entry is Foxconn. They've got a, roughly a million square feet where they're making all those Dell computers. Well, that other side of the border is also important to us because they're gonna attract more businesses there for the same reason that businesses like Ed's are there on the U.S. side. On the Mexican side of the border, U.S. companies want to be as close to the border as possible, especially if you're making products that are, are very sensitive, like computers. You don't want them 50 miles into the, 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 the country because you want a security element around that. You want to be close to the border. So what's going to happen in the future is that area is going to continue to grow not only on the U.S. side of the border, but we're going to see growth on the Mexican side also. And mm -hmm. all those employees, the 7,000 that are working in this Foxconn plant, those guys are being bussed in from, for up, uh, from up to 20 miles away from the plant. So housing, food, schools, all of that has to go in on both sides of the border. All right, and that's all in, in upcoming plans. Correct. Okay, Absolutely. okay, all right. And, and I can, can you give us um, uh, a, an amount of time that, that oh, we can start seeing well, this new development? Let, let's look at it this way. The Union Pacific Project's supposed to be completed in 2015. You're going to have 600 people on site. They're going to need food. They're going to need to go to convenience stores. They're going to need places to live. And again, the momentum that's going on right now is going to attract those type of businesses. 
Uh, the visit I had out uh, yesterday at the Union Pacific site was with a, a restaurateur who was looking at putting in uh, an eatery there in the Santa Teresa area. Um, it, in the next three years, you're going to see development like southern New Mexico hasn't seen ever. Very good. Um, Ed, would you like to uh, add anything else before we uh, wrap up today? No, just thank you for uh, inviting and uh, certainly uh, uh, I'm excited to be a, a new resident of New Mexico and uh, uh, enjoy the people and enjoy the place. Where are you? Uh, where are you coming from? Uh, uh, I came from Indianapolis, Indiana, which is is a wonderful city, uh, yeah. but we don't get 350 days a year of sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Um, well, I'd like to thank you two gentlemen for coming to visit us on on Fronteras. Uh, again, we had uh, Jerry Pacheco. He's a uh, vice president for the Border Industrial Association, um, and uh, Ed Camden. He's a uh, president of the Southwest Steel Coil. Um, I'm Monica Ortiz Uribe, and thanks for joining us on uh, Fronteras, the Changing America Desk. <laughs>